my friends, here we are, looking at each other's precious faces on a screen in a way that has come to seem normal and represents the fact that we continue to crave human connection, even as our love for each other keeps us from putting our communities in danger with further spread of this devastating disease. Our hearts have been broken over the last six months as we have seen immeasurable suffering from the virus itself but also from inequalities that have been created by our policies and systems over many centuries. This pandemic has laid bare the flaws of our society in showing how many people live so close to the edge, in showing inequities in all aspects of our lives, in highlighting how flimsy our safety net is, and in showing how many people live very lonely lives. And of course, this pandemic reminds us just how much relationships matter. In the midst of the devastation and fear, we've seen how people across the country have stepped up to help friends, neighbors, and total strangers. If it's not too cliche to quote Camus, I'll point to the line in the plague where he concludes, what we learn in time of pestilence, that there is more to admire in humanity than to despise. It comes as no surprise that community mediation volunteers, AmeriCorps members, and staff are among those who have stepped up and become heroes in this challenging time. The 10-point model of community mediation has always been about meeting people where they are, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. The lockdown has brought a whole new dimension to what this means. Our work has always allowed us to engage in person, the interactions and connections being so crucial to the transformations we've been able to facilitate. Meeting people where they are has taken us to every neighborhood, courthouse, and prison in the state, at all hours of the day and night, and has meant bringing a non-judgmental process to people in the depths of conflict and often hopelessness. Now, people were stuck in their homes, only leaving if their essential work required it. In some cases, they were stuck at home with people with whom they had a great deal of conflict. For others, previously manageable conflict became much more challenging with the constant proximity and the stress of the pandemic and new economic strain. Parents who were separated and had disagreement about issues related to raising children found those issues heightened in need of resolution. Fishers in the community came to the surface as leaders needed to make major public health decisions quickly. And as brave protesters across the country brought attention to racial inequity and police brutality, communities needed collaborative spaces for these conversations. While CMM has spent years developing best practices for in-person mediation and working hard for the chance to operationalize it even in maximum security prisons, it was clear that for this period, meeting people where they were was going to mean using technology for virtual mediations. I'm so proud and grateful to the CMM staff who scrambled and worked tirelessly to quickly establish systems for online mediation. We still consider these virtual mediations to be a third best practice, but we developed processes to allow for mediators to continue to meet people where they were with an ethical and non-judgmental process. It is no surprise to me that volunteers from across the state stepped up to say, show me how, let me help. And they did. One mediation began behind bars as a reentry case between a man who was incarcerated, his mother and his girlfriend. He was in prison for accidentally killing his sister's son in a fight with family members. He and his sister had not spoken as his sister was devastated. After he was released from prison, additional mediations were being scheduled, but he died suddenly. His death led to his sister to decide to mediate with their mother and his girlfriend to heal the things that had not gotten addressed while he was alive. These healing mediations have been online and are heading into their third session. In another mediation, two nonprofit professionals doing critical work during COVID-19 were unable to collaborate due to a long broiling feud over intersection intersecting job duties. Through a Zoom mediation, they were able to agree on communication methods, collaborative projects, and separate job descriptions, allowing them to serve the community during this crucial time and into the future. Another situation came to mediation from a COVID-specific challenge. A great uncle was furious at his nephew. The nephew had borrowed his car without permission 
to take his grandfather to the doctor so that the grandfather wouldn't have to risk using public transportation during the pandemic. But the nephew got into an accident during this unauthorized trip, resulting in a great deal of anger, financial cost, and criminal charges. By using mediation, they were able to heal their relationship, make plans to pay the insurance deductible, and request to drop the criminal charges filed. In April, in response to the devastation wrought by COVID-19 on vulnerable populations, Tri Community Mediation invited a broad range of community stakeholders to an online facilitation to discuss and develop collaborative solutions. As the group has continued to meet, it has become clear to everyone that while a task force formed in response to the pandemic, the barriers to resources, including healthcare, food, housing, and education, that have been highlighted by the pandemic are systemic, complex, and will require sustained attention and problem solving long after the current health crisis is over. Social justice and racial justice issues are at the heart of this work. This task force has created a unique and unprecedented space on the Lower Shore for stakeholders to gather and share experiences and resources, and TCM continues to facilitate these crucial conversations. These are just a few of the many situations engaged with, resolved, and transformed because community mediation was able to meet people where they were, even when that place was Zoom. As all of the institutions in the state were scrambling to figure out how to respond to the range of challenges, CMM was in a strong position to support people directly in their community and also as a referral source for the judiciary and their self-help center, which desperately needed a place to direct the many Marylanders in conflict seeking assistance. Even while working to meet the needs of Marylanders, CMM has continued our role as a national leader. Tracy assisted centers around the country who CMM has trained in inclusive mediation to figure out how to shift to online mediation, and people across the U.S. logged on for CMM's online trainings. Erica worked with a community mediation center in Minneapolis to help them support transformative dialogue as part of the community's call for racial justice and structural change. At the same time, a new urgency emerged. The confluence of the pandemic's unmasking of deep inequities and the capture of particularly brutal police killings of unarmed black people brought greater intensity to the Black Lives Matter movement and created a broader understanding of the need to reconsider law enforcement and criminal justice. CMM and community mediation centers in Maryland have been demonstrating for decades how community mediation and the services we offer create a foundation for that new society we seek to build. At every stage of where our current racially biased criminal justice system funnels people, disproportionately black and brown, into mass incarceration, community mediation creates another pathway. Calls for defunding the police are ultimately about providing services that resolve underlying issues instead of criminalizing poverty, conflict, and mental illness. For decades, community mediation centers have engaged communities and encouraged people in conflict to reach out to community mediation rather than calling the police on their neighbors. And research has consistently shown that mediation results in a decrease in repeat calls to the police compared to equivalent cases, even after holding constant for other factors. Our national reckoning with racial justice has also led to a broader conversation about the school to prison pipeline and the disproportionate use of exclusionary discipline with children of color and children with disabilities. Community mediation centers and CMM have been on the forefront providing services in schools and engaging at the state level with policymakers to integrate restorative approaches into school systems across the state. There also seems to be a greater understanding developing at the national level of how criminal justice responses to many misdemeanors and to addiction and mental health issues have buried people further into the system of mass incarceration rather than solving the underlying issues. For over 25 years, community mediation in Maryland has been offering a different path for people with criminal charges against them. Our research has shown that cases that are mediated are less likely to result in short-term criminal justice involvement and five times less likely to return to court with new charges in the next 12 months compared to equivalent cases, even after holding constant for other factors. Community mediation has also been effective in drug courts where, no surprise, relationships matter and need healing and attention as part of the broader problem-solving approach. 
Finally, even after deep involvement of the criminal justice system, community mediation is a powerful tool to keep people from returning to prison. CMM's reentry mediation model has been shown to decrease the predicted probability of recidivism, breaking a cycle for people who have been trapped in the system of mass incarceration, in some cases for years. It is truly never too early and never too late. The community mediation movement has been doing this crucial work for decades. We know what needs to be done. We know what works to solve problems in the community and keep people out of the criminal justice system. We have the quantitative research that demonstrates the effectiveness of these approaches, and we have the stories of the precious individual lives and relationships that were transformed by our interventions. But it is not enough. As a summer of protests and reflection has unfolded, we are called on to do more. We have the building blocks that are essential pieces of this new society that communities across the country are rising up and demanding. We must build. In this, one of the most challenging times many of us have lived through, the community mediation movement has continued to meet people where they are and support them as they build a new way forward. I am so grateful for what each of you, staff, volunteer mediators, board members, AmeriCorps members, donors, have done to bring the movement to this place. Now, we take it to the next level. Now we harness the energy, the deeper understanding, what is for some a newfound commitment and for others the exhausted extension of generations fighting for justice. And we will work with our communities to build this new world, a world where our responses are grounded in an understanding that relationships matter, community matters, everyone's voice matters, a world with real racial equity. There is so much to do. Tonight we celebrate all we have done, our incredible volunteers, and the movement that we have created. And tomorrow we get back to work. There is more in humanity to admire than to despise, and we have been called on to bring it forth. Let's go.